This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded February 18th, 2013, episode 133, with guest Ron Kwan, tenacious transistor teacher. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamble of Chris Gamble's Analog Life. And I'm Ron Kwan in Cupertino, uh, the author of Build Your Own Transistor Radios. Thanks for joining us, Ron. You're Thank an, you. A self, a, is it a self-published book or is it through, uh, uh, no, it's Tab, isn't it? It is Tab uh, through yeah. McGraw-Hill. Right. Uh, tell us about that. How did you... Uh, well, no, oh. let's start with your background. Let's not jump into the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell us about your history. Where are you from? Uh, Who have you worked for? What do you do? Okay, so I went to uh, San Francisco Public Schools, and uh, the high school that I went to is Galileo High School. Ooh, which Galileo. Is, yeah, so mm. our, our high school was one of the few that actually had a real reflecting telescope wow. in the observatory. <laughs> no way. And it's the name then, huh? really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so we can watch, uh, we can look up and see the, the rings of Saturn and the moons and stuff like that. Uh, and then I went on to the University of California at Berkeley and mm-hmm. got my uh, double E degree there, basically in signals and circuits uh and also in feedback systems so that's right. that's what i i kind of avoided the transistor physics stuff and the e m <laughs> stuff so right. <laughs> uh, but but in the, in the middle of that uh to pay my way i worked at uh, a radio station that was owned by metro media at the time which is uh, it did call the call signs are still there it's called kenew and that's uh, that was in oakland and I was their maintenance engineer, and I had also worked uh, previous to that the FM 10-watt campus radio station at UC Berkeley, uh, whose call letter is K-A-L-X. Ah, <laughs> no wonder you got into radios. <laughs> yeah. And and so I got – and so the campus radio station is an FM station, and KNEW is an AM station. So I got exposure to – both types of transmissions and and how it's broadcasted and uh, lots lots of things related to the studio and some things related to the actual transmitter. Right. Like many others, did you have like us? Did you have like a hobbyist? Well, maybe not Chris, um, but did you have an early <laughs> hobbyist background? Yeah, I did. I uh, I would start it with uh, playing with uh, compasses and batteries and coils and stuff like that when I was Excellent. very small, and had my number six uh, ignition dry cell, which probably older people understand what yeah, that I was is. Say, it looks no, like an, no, I don't know. It looks, that like, one, it looks no? like an oversized D cell that's huge with battery terminals on it. <laughs> and <laughs> endless hours of entertainment. When they're all used up, yeah, you can use. <laughs> You take out the carbon rod, and you get two of them, and you can start trying to make yourself an arc lamp out of it. (laughs) You can actually take the you can take the rod out of it. What you can unscrew the end cap or something? What do you? Well, you what you do is you take a screwdriver and you basically (laughs) pound out the the top of it, pull out all the used up electrolyte, and what's left is the is the carbon rod, and it actually has still the terminal, the the sort of a binding post terminal. Mm left on it and so if you get two of them together and you sharpen it the right way you might be able to make some type of arc lamp <laughs> oh, brilliant so, so they're not selling these at Toys R Us these days I take it uh, no no there was a a, there was a place in San Francisco that sold the surplus versions of it for like 50 cents nice right and uh, and so we would buy those and they would still have like you know, they still have a charge on them, and you mm. know they were about maybe half charged, but but uh, they were pretty good. And you know, and when they were done, you can get these nice. You know, the carbon rods were roughly mm. about who I would say about six to seven inches long. Wow! You, you can look it up on Google. It's, it's called a number six ignition battery. 
<laughs> and, and, great uh, stuff. And it had great surge current. When they were new, it could surge probably <laughs> in the order of 20 to 25 amps or something like Whoa. that. They, you know, yeah. I know nice. at least, yeah, on a really good one and definitely at least 10, you know, so it was, mm. uh, it was very good. They, they used to use those, I think, out in the farms and things like that back in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got to really crank them over. <laughs> so this was before you were 10, was it? Uh. Yeah, it was before I was 10. Excellent. <laughs> I played with those things. <laughs> yeah, and so I had my, my experience with iron filings and and uh, wires and making flashlights, yeah. uh, things like that. Uh, and then uh, later on, I learned how to uh, build crystal radios, which mm-hmm. I think everybody else did. And But I, I had all these different kinds of crystal radios um, that I would build you know things that that use um poly the the uh, the type of variable capacitors that were used in transistor radios and then the ones that look like bread slicers the, the right, dielectric yep. ones and uh, messing around with it and i think as a kid uh, i never understood how to get enough selectivity out of it until one day i coupled the antenna uh, the long wire antenna into the tank circuit with a very, very small capacitor, ah. like, like 10 or 20 picofarads. And I said, yep. hey, it's it's pretty good. I wonder what causes this, but it works, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So in a sense, and then I, you I, find I, out 10 years later, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, and what, what it does is it decouples any resistive uh, losses from the antenna mm. that you're hooking up. And so you so it basically takes advantage of the full... Uh, queue of the of the tank circuit that you have so yep. uh so that that's that was a really neat thing except i didn't understand it at the time <laughs> no because that's like magic it's like but there's nothing there these wires aren't connecting it's just two plates like how does the signal how does that you know in, increase the uh selectivity of this thing it's just magic yeah, you know. Yeah, and some would say it's still magic. And, and like, uh, you know, well, a, yeah, I know. <laughs> it still seems like it sometimes, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it, by the time I was in, in junior high school or high school, then then I had built tube radios, and mm-hmm. uh, actually I got a five tube superhead actually working, and, awesome. and and that was pretty good. And and then from high school, that was kind of like the end of it. Then it, it became very. Uh, serious in terms of trying to get ready for college, and so I had to study, you know, lots of math and yeah, science yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Boo-hoo. And <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, in between my my high school and college entrance, my high high school grad from high school graduation to that summer before I get into Berkeley, uh, I got my radio telephone license, and uh, and that allowed me to work in almost any radio station except a real broadcast one so right. so the summer after that after my freshman year i got the first class license and and uh that allowed me to work at knew so it's a so, combined radio and television and t and sorry radio and tele- radio at, well okay so i got into tv after i graduated because uh i had worked for ampex and Ampex uh, Corporation was the first uh, company that made a, a practical videotape recorder in the 1950s. Ah. And before that, uh, people had tried to record videos. Some of them you'll see, uh, you know, in these uh, old, uh, I guess, nostalgic TV channels where they basically took uh, a motion picture camera and recorded what was on a picture tube and, you know, <laughs> right. and, and, and they kind of look kind of weird that way. So, so the fully electronic one was done by Ampex and, and about 1956 when it was introduced. And, and then I got in there about roughly 20 years later, <laughs> more than 20 <laughs> years later and worked on really the last, um, last of that vintage of kind of recorder and and then I was uh, offered to work for Sony, and at first they didn't tell me what type of video tape recorder would that be, and and I mm-hmm. said, well, are you are you recording broadcasts? Oh yeah, we're 
recording broadcasts, I say, are you using, you know, this frequency to that frequency for the after modulation? He says, no, 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 we're doing something different. And, and it turns out they scaled everything by about two and a half times. I said, well, what bandwidth are you doing here? He said, oh, we're doing 1125 lines. <laughs> you know, we're not right. doing that. Wow. That, that We're not doing that 525 or that's, 625. That's huge. Band. Yeah. When was this? this? Like, in 1980. 1980, right. Yeah. That's so, massive resolution for yeah. back then. Could, could, yeah. So, could you clarify? The, yeah. Sorry, the, uh, the, what, what was the resolution there? So it was. It's, it's what we call today 1080i. Oh wow! So it, it's uh, so we it's did this HD, folks. Yeah, yeah, it is HD, and it was uh, it was fantastic. That's when that's where I learned a lot of the the FM wideband uh, detectors, how how to do that, how to recover the thing off tape, you know, what to do before you process this thing, and mm-hmm. it, it's very very. Uh, there's kind of a, I guess, an American acronym for FM. And but it kind of like involves a kind of a four letter word in, <laughs> right. instead, yes. and then later the M stands for magic. <laughs> so, and and that's yeah, basically what it. it is. And because in in video you uh, you modulate the carrier almost at the same frequency you're modulating with. So like if you have four wow. megahertz, yeah, four, four megahertz bandwidth, your carrier could be very you know could be you know in the order of about five to ten megahertz yep you know so for instance uh svhs if you used to remember that yes format i think it's from 5.6 to 7 megahertz for the carriers but the bandwidth is about four megahertz <laughs> you know? wow. so, crazy so and and they can actually recover it and it kind of it almost seems like it violates nyquist in a sense it kind of <laughs> but it doesn't quite yeah. right and uh, and you're able to recover with, with some uh you know something good enough to be viewed you know, so, so, so you were working in the design group at sony on these yeah. cameras yeah uh, how for, big for the, for how big recorder. were the design ah oh, for the for, right for yeah. the videotape recorders uh, in our team, we had uh, we really had one master who did it. Uh, he he was oh, the, okay. and I and I quote him in the in the book uh, Barrett Geisinger. And uh, but I have to to maybe just backtrack a little bit at Ampex. I learned how to uh, the ins and outs of some of the cameras, TV cameras, and then also I had to design a TV monitor while I was at Ampex. Mm. So so I got to design. Um, TV monitors at Ampex learn about video preamps and switchers and things like that. And then when I got to Sony, I got to learn about uh, uh, HDTV and also video switchers, dissolve amplifiers and and things like that. So it, it, it was really quite a experience, a, a very rich experience because it, it's not like um, just designing – uh, mm. You know, one particular kind of instrument for your whole career. I got to do a little bit of everything, but but right. actually, my specialty is, uh, if I have to say of any, it w- was the uh, designing uh, black and white TV monitors, CRT type displays, and things like that. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> and I actually got my first um, patent. Well, one of my first patent ideas from that, and and. And it's kind of mentioned in the book a little bit, and that that was a very exciting story when I <laughs> to tell because uh, I had this problem where the uh, TV scans were causing people to be like fatter on one side of the screen and skinnier on the other side of the screen, <laughs> oh, okay. and that's caused by uh, a nonlinearity in the scan. So so if you're familiar with RC circuits, you see the the traditional exponential mm-hmm. uh, waveform. If you put a step response to it, you'll see yep. this exponential. Well, what you want in a scan is you want something to be a real ramp. You know, it does. It's totally linear. There's no change in slope. And and because there's resistive losses in the deflection coil, it causes uh, ah. what we call an L over R time constant. Whereas you know when you have capacitors, it's an RC time constant. So. So the problem was, how do you fix this? And and uh, the way to do it is that you can send an inverse correction signal and mm-hmm. fix that 
that you know fix that so that you give a signal that it's complementary to this this exponential uh, waveform, mm. and so you end up with a linear more of a ramp. Ramp, thing. right? You yeah. end up with a perfect linear, well, almost perfect linear ramp, good enough yeah. so that you don't see it visually. Yeah. So, so does a yeah, compensation so... happen? The actual the the signal being put through the the <laughs> the bending yeah, tube part. <laughs> it's actually put. Yeah. So what what I did was we're we're, uh, we're experts here, Ron, right? Right. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. So this is what I did. So I took a very very small resistance in uh, and put that in series with the coil, sort of a, a, as a sense. You know, sort of like yeah. how voltage regulators can sense right. short circuits. You put it like a point one ohm, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really harm the regulator too much because it's negligible voltage drop. So what I did was I put a small resistor in series with the coil. I said, well, it doesn't matter. This thing's got ohms of, you yeah. know, resistances anyway. Yeah. So adding another, you know, half an ohm is gonna, you know, it's not gonna make anything that much worse. So I would sense the current, and then I would compare it with a real ramp. You know, oh. and oh, then so, from so there, you would generate a real ramp in synchronized in real time, would you? Yeah, and so I would I right. would take the different signal between the exponential oh. uh, waveform and a real ramp signal and do a subtraction. Oh, of course, that's and, obvious. Yeah. Well, now yeah. we and hear then, it. And then, but then, <laughs> but then the part is, uh, but then where do you feed this thing yeah. back? And I fed right. it back through. I fed it back through the damper diode, which was not too obvious, uh, and uh. and it worked. And uh, and so that was one of my first patents. Brilliant. And that <laughs> and and that made it into following products, did it? It did. Uh, right. Fortunately, it uh, it fixed the problem, and it was kind of a it it was a very nice way how to solve it because there yeah. were no linearity coils and things like that. Mm. Uh, the the original way how to solve it is you put a linearity coil in series with with the deflection yoke and. Uh, that used Ampex at that time didn't want to want me to design it that way, so I came up with this other way, and right. it, it it turned out pretty pretty good. So what what and, what era was this? Was this like uh, I mean, was this done in, with like op amps for the subtraction, or was it done actually like discreetly? Or um... it was done with op amps. Okay. Yeah, matter of fact, I think I had to use a seven forty one because. <laughs> The 741 or something slow because in that environment with all the high voltage and spikes going all over, it was the only op amp that was bulletproof. Oh, yeah. Right. The, the, in nearby there. So if I stuck a really faster op amp in there, uh, the input circuits could get fried a little bit more easily. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I used a tried and true op amp. And as long as it's close enough, it didn't have to, uh, you know, uh, represent the ramp you know, down to like 0.1%. It just had to do it close enough so that when people are right. walking across the screen, they don't look like they've changed their weight. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. So, now, you know, as the engineers would say, as long as it's close enough. Yeah, exactly. Right. As long as the boss buys it. Speaking of that, <laughs> you're, you're probably the guy to answer this. There's a... I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, but there's a joke going around that they back in the early Japanese TV, and uh, I guess it extends to video um, stuff as well, that the Japanese method of manufacture was to actually you know, really over-engineer something, and then when you go into production, you would start removing components, and then as soon as and as soon as it stopped working, you would put that last component back, and bang, you'd ship it, um, <laughs> so that you know you just get rid of any components that you didn't need. Is that well, uh, is there any truth to that at all? There's probably some because you know it is a a, a production thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spent yep. a, a lot of my career on um, doing board level. Things I, I only designed mm. one op, one one IC, and that was for HP. Uh, but all the other things that I did, like for a monitor, a video switcher, or an audio system, these are board level things. And uh, some of the people would say, "Okay, you need to put the coupling caps on all of your you know, right. power power uh, connections for your op amps, your uh, your your digital." circuits mm-hmm. you know like pins so you'd end up six. with 50 decoupling caps yeah, yeah and <laughs> yeah and, exactly. big. and so yeah and so what happened was people would say but you can do every other so every now and then i would <clears throat> if i wanted to save space i would put every other 
Uh, mm-hmm. You know, deco- every other IC will have a decoupling cap as long as they were pretty close to each other, like yep. within half an inch or something like that. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the transistor radios, uh, when I look at the Japanese transistor radios, actually, uh, the only thing they would probably skimp on is probably the uh, decoupling capacitors for the power supplies. There would be, okay. be only maybe one or two decoupling capacitors for, for the battery, and then maybe one or two for the audio circuit and one for the, for the automatic volume control. Uh, mm-hmm. capacitor and then and then that was about it but the way how they did design some of these things were kind of inefficient as well but they just you know they, a lot of them just copy from each other so You're right so <laughs> that's it. yeah because when i looked at some of these circuits uh and i have in the book i quote a lot of the howard sam's uh photo fact which um has the schematics of all these radios since almost the beginning Mm-hmm. And I look at these, and I said, "Boy, they could have rebiased this circuit this way or that way or whatever." But mm-hmm. you have to remember, back in those days, the designers were uh, not very fluent on transistor circuits, but more on tube circuits. Oh, right. You okay. know, so, <laughs> so and most of them did not really quite understand how these transistors really work. And so, uh, as as I went through some of these things, I said, "Wow, this this is quite." amazing how they even got some of this stuff to work. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I've done a video where I tore down a 1985 vintage Sony video camera. It was one of the first, um, you know, of the, you know, uh, um, big tape, um, you know, handy cam uh, kind right. of things. And I went through the schematic and everything like that in the video, and it was phenomenal, the complexity yeah. involved in the schematic. And I'm going... How the hell did they design this thing? There's so many systems and subsystems and filters and everything yeah. else. How how does that work? Do they actually go through and do it all in theory, or do they just suck it and see? Or well, I, you know, I did work for Sony, and the way that that I when I was there, I uh, the, the people came up the the ladder very very slowly. They became specialists, right. and actually, they started from the beginning. So they. They actually had to know how to solder and how to work the uh, the, the bureaucracy in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, ECNs, PCNs, you know, electronic yeah. change notices, <laughs> notices production change yeah. notices, all those kinds of changed, things. Nothing's changed, folks. <laughs> uh, and, and then, then eventually, you know, they get to design some stuff, and they would learn that through uh, a mentoring kind of system, you know, so a more senior engineer would do that, and. Uh, but yeah, a video camera is very complicated because mm. it has to do. It, it contains scans, scanning circuits. It, if it's a tube camera, it has to have um, high voltage uh, supplies as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It has to have low noise preamps. The, the low noise preamps typically uh, have to convert something like anywhere you know in order of maybe a hundred to three hundred nanoamps of of current. Uh, yeah. into some type of usable voltage. And then once you have that, you have to now uh, encode that into an NTSC or a PAL signal. So there's there's another thing called an encoder that takes all the all the color channels mm-hmm. and, and, and makes that into what they call a composite signal. And uh, and so there's just a, there's a lot of – and then, of course, there's an audio system in there as well. So, you know. Uh, it's it's very complicated. But the fun thing about video is that there's just so many types of signals you have to learn about. You have to learn about clamp circuits. You have to learn mm-hmm. about about DC restoration. You have to learn about scan circuits. You have to learn about low noise amplifiers. Why input capacitances of uh, JFITs uh, will wreck your signal to noise ratio and things ah. like that. Uh, how to properly design a trans-resistance amplifier, things like that, um, and then, uh, and then also y- you have to, to a certain degree, uh, have to do uh, a- AGC circuits as well. So you have to mm-hmm. know how to make voltage-controlled amplifiers, and so <laughs> there's so it, many analog building blocks in there. It's it's almost you know you you take an analog design building block textbook and you implement every single one of those in some way shape or form it's incredible
Mm, that's trivial, yeah. <laughs> land tech or whatever, and uh, or what used to be a land tech. Uh, yeah, uh, they've gone bust, yeah. I, I think they they got sold to another IC company. Yep. And 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 work with that. And then if you want um uh voltage controlled amplifiers, you would go to analog devices or or you would have mm-hmm. to make your own. And so lots of times we made our own video op amps and, and voltage controlled amplifiers with uh RCA transistor arrays. You know, like <laughs> right. uh, the CA thirty eighty six or the C A thirty fifty four or something like that or or the thirty one twenty seven. So that those kind of uh, transistor rates were very, very useful mm. for for our things, uh, and they, and and they would be matched too, wouldn't they? Because they were on the same uh, die, yes, so it, they would, yeah, yeah, definitely. And that the other thing about uh, video is that it does go through a lot of signal theory, so you have to know, uh, like for instance, mm. in cameras, and I actually also in video tape recorders, you have to know about what they call aperture correction. And that's that's like a phase linear treble boost, and how to do that. Uh, and there's ways how to do that with delay lines. There's way how to do that with double differentiator circuits. You know, wow. all sorts of really neat <laughs> stuff. And uh, and also sampling theorem too, because a lot of times, you know, by the time I you know got out of college, people were starting to digitize uh, the the video signal to to make mm-hmm. it stable. Uh, because before that, they use analog time-based mm. correction. They use a, a bank of varactor diodes, <laughs> and and they literally change the voltage on each of their varactor diodes <laughs> to change the delay. <laughs> and and you'd be and uh, you'd be surprised how many sections there were. There might be about I don't know twenty or fifty yeah, sections yeah. there. Uh, so uh, so with with the advent of you know, cheap memory, if you can even call that back in the 1970s or 80s, but it was still preferable to, you know, <laughs> finding 50 match pairs of reactor diodes and, you know, make it manufacturable. Uh, so, wow. <laughs> but, oh, that's but, hilarious. So, yeah, so, you, so we actually, so with video, you actually learn quite a bit also about filter responses, you know, the Chevy mm-hmm. Chef, the Bessel, the uh, Butterworth filters, and yep. Cower Chevy Chefs, and stuff like that. And it's... Uh, it's very and also phase equalization as well, which is a, a subject that not too many people get to play with. So, and all that filter stuff is very important because if you use the wrong type of filter response for the wrong part, you might get sort of you know phase distortion and all this analog stuff matters. So your picture might start yeah. to do something bizarre. Right? Yeah. So you really yeah. have to know what you're doing. Yes, uh, exactly, and. In an FM system, uh, even a, in a regular FM tuner that you have for radio, uh, the the IF section, if you want uh, low distortion that's demodulated, the IF filter should be phase equal, uh, phase equalized mm. or phase linear, and yep. uh, and the way how some of the old style IF filter filters got away with that was, they just made it broader than normal. But still good enough to have enough selectivity, so that that area where it's demodulating, like the first couple of hundred kilohertz, uh, for the FM, you know, uh, bandwidth, it is has enough phase linearity before it kind of blows up and goes crazy. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so, so that's why uh, you will see, like in specs, where they give you a narrow IF filter, uh, the. The, the phase linear, linearity is not very good, and you would get increased demodulated distortion coming out yep. of it. And, At yeah. what point did the industry start to realize, well, look, this analog <laughs> This is expensive. Stuff, analog video is just pointing, is pushing brown stuff up a hill with a pointy stick. It's useless. We have to go it, to digital. It, yeah, basically, it, it came in two fronts, uh, at, at least two fronts. One was... Uh, when uh, when the cameras were being built, uh, the tube, the the, the pick the tube pickup tubes called plumbicons or saticons and all that, that was that was just old stuff. They couldn't get the sensitivity out of that right. compared to a CCD or a CMOS sensor. Uh huh. And so that happened really around the late 70s. And then when it came to recording the uh, you know the uh, mm. video. 
uh, the, the analog way of doing it was just taking up too much space. Yeah. And, yep. and also uh, it, it had a problem of um, you couldn't make a serial copy, like a copy of a copy of a copy. copy. It would just get worse and worse and worse, yeah. yeah. The Xerox yeah. effect. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially, you know, the contrast builds up kind of funny when you do a Xerox of a Xerox yeah. of a Xerox and, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And and in, in video with, uh, with analog video, if you do a copy of a copy, the noise comes up, the – the, the the ringing effects of the filters get get oh, more pronounced, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, and it's the same thing with audio. Like if, for instance, if if you go and say um, my audio frequency response is twenty to twenty kilohertz, plus or minus a half a dB, or about roughly five percent, mm -hmm. you would say, hey, that's pretty good. But run that through ten of them <laughs> like that, yeah. Yeah. then you're up to like plus or minus five dBs yeah. or something like that, and right. that's that's huge, you know. <laughs> so, so the good thing about so the digital uh, got in really well, I think, toward the late '80s or back to in the mm -hmm. '80s, and then they started using discrete cosine transforms and uh, you know having uh, good compression characteristics because yep. because that's the other problem is. If you were to put straight uh, digitized video without any compression onto tape or a hard drive, you'll be burning up a lot of memory, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Well, uh, the good because the frame rate and the pixel rate is just enormous. Yeah. Right. And you have to do some kind of compression. So uh, mm -hmm. that's that's where uh, you know these these discrete cosine transforms or wavelets or mm -hmm. I don't know JPEG two thousand kind of stuff. Right. Uh, work out and uh so it, it there was a, there's just a bunch of explosion and i would say about by the 1990s uh basically most of the analog stuff was gone yeah uh and the same thing same thing with uh with aud audio stuff as well uh you know you it, course, it wouldn't make yeah. sense to uh, it wouldn't make sense to buy an open reel tape recorder in the 1990s <laughs> just be better <laughs> to no you know, by the 19 <laughs> Yeah, matter of fact, but I think like the nineteen late nineteen seventies or early eighties, there there were uh, PCM processors for audio, mm -hmm. so you, which like convert mm -hmm. your Betamax or your VHS into a, a, a two channel <laughs> digital audio machine, and 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 then you can record digitally. So, uh, yep. so I, I saw quite a bit of changes <laughs> yeah, during that time, at least. <laughs> and and those compression. Um, Algorithms they weren't they actually had a loss associated with them too didn't they? Uh, the the losses some of them are not that noticeable. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. uh, you would start seeing it, uh, you know, motion you know in the emotional way uh, in like uh, you know if there was a quick uh, yes a, of course a quick uh, yeah. change from one frame to the other. One of the worst things to record on high compression video is. Uh, take a picture of a fireplace with a fire burning at, at a random oh, way yeah. and, and compress right. the video as much as you can. You'll start because seeing... Because it's, it's truly random. Yeah. And it's, yeah, exactly. It's high contrast. Yeah. It can't... It, yeah, it can't because the one of the... One of the uh, one of the uh, premise of having compression is you kind of assume nothing has changed much from the previous frame. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And but if everything changes all the time, then, <laughs> then the only thing you have, then the only thing you can do is do the compression from, you know, within the frame, uh, you mm -hmm. know, separately, sort of like like a like a JPEG or something like that. Yep. But that's that's getting probably a little bit beyond what. I'm used to. I'm more used to the, the analog video stuff. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of video, there's a lot. Uh, I guess to to just go down some of the things you learn in video, you learn lots of I and Q modulation. You learn single side band or, or double side band uh, type stuff. Uh, quadrature modulation. You learn filters. You learn phase uh, response. Um, mm -hmm. Low noise. Uh, scan circuits, power supplies, uh, switching power supplies, you know, it's just, <laughs> just so many things. Uh, and, and, and during those days, we actually, when we did the video op amps, we actually built them with like maybe three or four transistors. And that was Excellent. it. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. We just, 
And and a lot of people said, you can get away with that? I said, yeah, with video, you can. We wouldn't do this for audio. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so is, so is, this, is this an art form that's lost now? I mean, obviously, as a, obviously I do different types of analog, but uh, I mean, on the video side, is it, is it still around anywhere? I don't think so. It's it's very yeah, it's pretty it's pretty rare to see that. Yeah. And I, I was uh, I think I, I went to one of the flea market breakfasts uh, uh, Paul Rako had, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the guys asked me like, "What do you know about DC restoration?" Uh, and he, and I said, well, you have to look at it this way. The DC restorator is really sort of like a half wave rectifier, charging up that capacitor in series to a, you know, voltage such that by the time when you reach to the other end of it, uh, everything looks like it's clamped to zero volts or something close to that. And, and, and so, uh, you have to look at it in a different way than just looking at the way that, that it's drawn. So. Um, mm. and so there's, there's, it is kind of a loss art, but, um, you know, I don't know whether it would ever reappear. I don't think, I don't think anybody, I don't think it matters anymore. No, well, there's no practical need for <laughs> right. it, right? It's, not it's as switched. Much. Yeah. It's switched to information yeah. theory with compression algorithms and all that sort of thing these days. Well, so, the, the concepts are still know, valid, of, but it's just, yeah, for video specifically, course, right? not used for practical yeah. aspects. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, th- these issues still exist. Like I'm a, you know, I make my living as a video, um, editing video, and I've got to think about, you know, what uh, data rate I'm using to co- to compress the video, which formats I'm converting to, you know, to minimize yeah. my losses and compression, you know, because if you make a copy of a copy of a copy, it right. still can actually get worse. A lot of those things are still around, a lot of those issues. Yeah. Because everything, oh, digital, every copy is perfect. Well, yeah, every copy, but... Every time mm-hmm. you pass it through a, another transcoding algorithm, you're, you know, right. doing some very fancy analogy type, lossy stuff to it. So, yeah, it could be you know just the interpolation filters and things like that. Uh, I think one of my friends who's into video production said that he couldn't find even a decent program yet to just transcode HD 1080i back to a proper looking. 525, you know, or 480i. Exactly. Signal. And you think that'd be trivial, right? But no, I've, yeah, yeah I've had people, um, yeah, say the same thing, you know, even, you know, you use the best tool in the industry and it's still not good enough. So yeah. there's, uh, yeah, definitely. You know? and, and, you know, the other flip side about doing video is you do go into audio as well. And mm. because in, in, in video tape recorders, they actually have, you know, if you look at the old tape recorders, they actually have, uh, an audio tape recorder section that looks just like an audio regular open reel, you know, audio tape recorder. So mm-hmm. you have a uh, biasing of the erase, uh, biasing of the heads and the erasures and, uh, having to hit, um, uh, the flux densities, I don't know, whatever, 185 nanolevers yeah. and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And, oh, man. Uh, and, and also you have to deal with low noise, uh, audio preamps and, record amplifiers and and uh, line amplifiers and things like that so it, it's it's a very rich experience um i don't particularly recommend it for everybody but you know <laughs> i uh i was very fortunate to have two great mentors to to do that you know to teach me one mm. side of of um uh, cameras and and video in general and then the other one who taught me quite a bit about color you know the the coding of it. You know. Oh yes, Pal there's an art in itself. NTSC, yeah. Mm. So. And you've also been involved. You used to work for Macrovision, right. Right? right? Everyone from the who was around in the uh, 80s would know what Macrovision is. It's right. A copy protection. Yeah. Stuff for video, um, which you're yeah. not really allowed to talk about. Much, not too much. Are you? No. Why uh, is that? Can you tell us why you're not allowed to talk about it? I, I'll probably just refrain to just say that there are probably people listening out there. Right. <laughs> okay. so, so, but I can talk about macrovision in terms of the scrambling uh, oh, yes. technologies. Oh, yes, Yeah, that was interesting yes. hearing about um, that. Yeah, that, that's very interesting stuff. So this, is, this predates the digital scrambling. This is more like the cable TV scrambling <laughs> days of the yeah, analog. Right. So this is maybe if, of, if you got a channel that you weren't supposed to and you're trying to figure out what was yes. on the screen. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so 
<laughs> so my experience was is was in uh, Cabo analog scrambling, and both for video and audio. And mm-hmm. the audio scrambling that I did was based on frequency translation. So it basically took your spectrum and moved it up by about a kilohertz or so. So you ended mm-hmm. up sounding like a Donald Duck or something like yep. that. Right. And and then what it also did was it changed that one kilohertz shift to maybe 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and it moved it in kind of a pseudo-random way. And so if you go and say, well, the guy offset at the, the spectrum by one kilohertz, that's no, no big deal. I'll just shift it back down by one kilohertz. And, of course, if you mm-hmm. did that, what will happen at, you know, a tenth of a second later, it went to a different frequency. So <laughs> you, would, you, 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 would, you would have to keep you would have to keep track of how the shift was going because it, it varied all over the map. And fortunately, I had a friend that was uh, very, very sharp in, in doing this kind of stuff. And I said, why don't you, uh, this is the function I want and stick it on an EEPROM and I'll stick it into my counter circuits. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he came up with this crazy waveform and we stuck those into, I think, the, the presets of my, you know, uh, uh, 163 counters. And right. what, it, what it did was... Uh, you know, and and we counted so many frames of video, and then we're going to change the presets to something else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this was actually done in the digital domain, so to speak. It was linked to the to the video, so right. uh, the video has a frame rate roughly about you know thirty frames per second. So we we did it to like you know every frame it. It, we mm-hmm. started changing the, the the preset numbers to it, and so mm. ah. uh, so they they only had one thirtieth of a second to figure out what the next one was going to be <laughs> because it was going to change, <laughs> so, and that is, it wasn't worth it for them to do it. <laughs> so what about what about in those? Is this when those uh, like they had the descrambling boxes that you could get on like the black market that then you plug cable into? Is that is that what I'm thinking of? Is that the right time yeah, frame? Yeah, yeah. Those were those were what they call sync suppression systems where. The horizontal or the vertical sync pulses were either taken out or shifted in a funny way, mm-hmm. or the video was inverted mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And ours was a different scrambling system, and we shook up the picture laterally, and but we also did some uh, sync suppression as well. And uh, and so, but if, even if you restore the sinks in ours, uh, you would still see a shaky picture. So you had to ah, know right. how to, yes. you, you would have to, to decode it, you would have to come up with a sync signal that shook exactly the same way the picture was shaking. So if the oh, picture okay. was shaking compl- by, yep. you know, one microsecond, you have to give a sync post that was, you know, shifted by one microsecond. So everything tracked. Got and, it. Because I remember all these, these uh, sync suppression ones, they were very easy to bypass. Every electronics magazine had a project with a couple of transistors that, I think it was that easy. It was like a couple of transistors yeah. to, you know, overcome yeah. that and, uh, right. and just avoid it yeah yeah it was trivial yeah it was easy and so when when i got down to south america i i had to look at the these black boxes they had and figure out if if they are going to recreate everything uh, what do i do to spoof the black (laughs) box and so i found out what they were doing and came up with a thing that if you put the black box to try to decode the thing you came out with something even worse than what it was before <laughs> nice. yeah, right. and and yeah. uh and and so so it was a constant cyclic battle between you yeah. and the black box makers was it yeah yeah so we and, and it did work and uh, you know for for the cable black box thing uh they uh, there was a company that uh, that was building the set top decoders with with our descramblers in them and so that guy got to demonstrate it to to the people in South America because uh, uh, I, I went there like twice, like within the period of four months or something, and wow. I was just tired. Um, <laughs> uh, it's it's like it's I think it's like it's four hours ahead of Pacific time or something like eight or four or five. They call it Atlantic time. Yeah. And uh, it's in this Brazil? is down. 
This is in Brazil and in Argentina. Oh. So, <laughs> and this is actually where they're and, making these black boxes? Is that right? Well, they sell them in, on the street corners. Oh. It's, it's so funny. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> so you go to the night market where everybody's selling usually, you know, uh, clothes and hats and, you know, <laughs> Uh, may, maybe some cell phones or something, you know, the typical. And then you see these guys with these these black boxes, you know, <laughs> and they <laughs> just go from one one town to the next. So you don't really know who these guys are. So what you know? So what you do is you buy a couple of these, and then you try to find out, you know, what their decoding scheme was, and then how mm -hmm. to spoof that. And so that was one of the things I found out is that if you add some signals in the right places, uh, you can make that thing, you know, end up having a worse picture than uh, than if you saw it before. As it made mm. the picture shook up even more. <laughs> and, That's great. And, and, and uh, so it's like a spoofing the spoofer or something like that. So it's it, it kind of reminds me of that Mad Magazine. Spy versus Spy? Uh, the Spy versus Spy. Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, felt, <laughs> I, felt, yeah. I felt like I was, I was in that kind of a merry-go-round. Yeah, you know, that's like, great. Like, <laughs> has, has the battle finally been lost for, uh, you know, s digital security in um, content? Content I, security, because Apple famously removed their security content like a couple of years back, didn't they? They, I, I, um, I really don't know, uh, and I don't, and I don't even try to follow that at this point because right. uh, the, uh, and I'm not being evasive. It's just that I, I you know, mm -hmm. I, I still have, I still have. Somebody gave me an i, iPod Shuffle. And to tell you how old it is, it's the one that looks like, that that doesn't have a screen. Yeah, the white stick. And only have half half a gig of RAM in there. <laughs> that's what yeah. I have. And, and I, <laughs> yeah, and the, so that's where Love I'm I... at. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I just. Uh, I, I just don't keep up with that stuff anymore. You know, I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm still using cassette tapes. Or, although, you know, every now and then oh, I might LPs, do. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I, I don't know. I, all I can say in general, it is probably, probably hard to, uh, you know, to to keep ahead in that arena. Yeah. You know, that's right. that's, that's yep. all I can say is. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I could probably comment any further on that. <laughs> yeah, well, and they, and they were doing it in hardware back then, too. It's interesting how it shifted to software. And, you know, there's a whole different yeah. set of issues mm. with software. Yeah, I mean, basically, when they, they, uh, when they had even the, uh, the cable and satellite decoders, uh, what, what the hackers did was they did not hack the the algorithm to de-scramble it, that was too hard, so they hacked the authorization codes. Ah. Uh, yes, so, which so is was... legally a different way to do it, too. So you can get sued one way and not the other, and it all becomes a legal minefield. Yeah, and... but in the United States, as yeah. far as I understand, we have this uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, or something like that. And, yep. Uh, and uh, so I think if you do anything that comes even close to spoofing something then then you're going to be in trouble right so yeah. you know uh <laughs> but but that's but that's how they used to do it. it's like we, we're not going to even try to figure out how you did the scrambling yeah we'll f figure out how do you authorize things exactly. and we'll just pretend yeah. like we're one of the paying customers <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah you're the man in the middle type of thing and everything well you actually yeah you were mentioning a bunch of hackers that you were just hanging out with yet was it yesterday or no two days ago uh, you were at the uh, we, analog. We went to the, the yeah. analog party. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're we're analog engineers. I don't know what we can call. It. I guess we're <laughs> hackers in the uh, sense yeah, of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, of of uh, tearing apart things and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, that that was uh, Paul Rayko and others uh, had uh, organized that party. I think along with Linear Systems and some other people. Uh, hopefully, I don't forget too many people. And and uh, there, I'll send you the the link to that uh, when he gets all the pictures and everything. And then I was, I I had fun with my uh, digital camera, so I was shooting everything at ISO sixty four hundred and still managed to get some decent results. <laughs> wow, <Right. laughs> must have been yeah. brightly lit, lit room, huh? <laughs> no, it wasn't. But I use fast lenses. I oh, didn't good. use any zooms. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah. 
It's uh, I I did that once. I went on. I first time I got my digital SLR. I went on a uh, trip. Yeah. To, uh, you know, and went on holiday, and I found I had everything set to like ISO 1600. So every photo I took was all ISO 1600. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I shot. So with it a, was noisy, you know, so every video had all well, this noise. Yeah, you know, every picture had noise on it. It, tur- it turns out on my camera, it, there was a hidden, well, it's not a hidden menu. It's actually well known, but it says noise reduction for 1600 and above, and you can turn it on, and it mm-hmm. turns on this aggressive. Six, you know, noise reduction. Yeah. But, but I figured I'd say, hey, everybody likes kind of a soft picture anyway. <laughs> right. You so know? just leave the fuzzy noise in there. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> if if you take pictures that are too sharp, sometimes people might complain. <laughs> if you know right. what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Certainly do. So, <laughs> That's uh, why people don't like this, you know, newfangled CD music. You know, this digital music. They like the warm, fuzzy valve distortion (laughs) yeah yeah and and that that's that's another thing i also explore uh i uh i have uh written two papers for the audio engineering society oh uh in in 2010 and and just last year so right and and and, uh it's a it's a kind of somewhat controversial topic but i don't see it as controversial i see it like hey it's there (laughs) you know so and, and the premise of those was um I, I was finding ways to measure frequency modulation, distortion, and amplifiers. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, so that's another, that's probably another subject. But anyway, <laughs> so, what, so I dabble in that too. Yeah, what was the, what was the? What's your take on all the audio foolery? Rubbish. Oh, of course, Dave was going to ask this. All those audio file products. <laughs> yeah, I know, I've got to ask. Yes, you know, every all time. Those, you know, ten thousand dollar speaker cables and power cords and. Well, oh. uh, it's you know uh, <laughs> we we actually I actually have a past in in speaker cables because I actually had worked for Monster Cable. Uh, oh, and, you, and, you work and, for Monster Cable. Oh, here we yeah. go, folks. <laughs> uh, back in We've the got early a live days. One here. And. <laughs> And at that time, and I think prob- I probably still, you know, uh, they they sold something that was reasonably economical uh, compared mm. to some of the other stuff. Uh, yeah, some of the other stuff, um, like for if you look at speaker cables, uh, some of them have very very high capacitance, and the reason why is they want to make the characteristic impedance uh, close to eight ohms. So right. when yeah, you yeah. look at what it is, it's the square root of L divided by C. And mm-hmm. so typically zip cord has an impedance about 96 ohms or somewhere around there, maybe 100 ohms. And so what are you going to do if you're going to try to make that thing go all the way down to 8 ohms or 10 Yeah, ohms? I know. You need well, a you, massive you, you, amount you, of... You can't change the inductance of the wire yeah. you know because it is what it is right yeah. I mean, you can <laughs> increase wire. it by coiling it but no, you can't make it the wire. yeah exactly <laughs> so the only thing you can do is increase the capacitance to get this thing down <laughs> and so uh so uh, although you know the, it the, it definitely will change the sound to it um now where it does it better that's another reason but it does change the sound to it in this sense in that that you can measure how it affects the uh, the pulse response of the amplifier because of mm. all this capacitance hanging on the speaker and then you have to kind of set some snubbing networks um, you know yep. along the you know either at the at the speaker end or maybe even at the amplifier end uh, or both or something mm-hmm. and it does change the sound and oh it certainly does um, that's see that's the thing that yeah. People don't understand with audio fuel. Yes, it makes a difference when the electrical characteristics are different. Yeah. So, but when you get two cables that have the same electrical characteristics, yeah. and then one claims that one sounds better because it's cryogenically frozen, then well, now we're into wankery <laughs> instead, well, <laughs> instead of science. You well, know? it's yeah, but it it kind of depends what the science uh, has found yet, and. And so that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, in, in the um, AES, uh, you know, papers that I'm writing, I'm trying to show different ways how to measure things. And mm-hmm. uh, because uh, there's a there's just a lot of things that have been done in a very old fashioned way in mm-hmm. measuring audio. If you think about it, OK, most people will measure 
total harmonic distortion and intermodulation distortion and frequency response, right? That's yep. basically the three, the three BGs, things. Yep. Maybe even two. I don't even know too many people do, will do intermodulation distortion. No, that's not that yeah, common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But you look at that. How old is that way of measuring it? dates back to like the 1920s or, or maybe even <laughs> pre, earlier. Pre-feedback theory? <laughs> I mean, that is, <laughs> that is, yeah, pre-feedback, pre, you know, Harold S. Black, yeah. uh, you know, doing his, his <laughs> negative feedback theory. And when we, when we did video, we always had a new waveform to check out certain things, like uh, why, why does the color shift when, you know, it goes through this kind of, you know, filter or go through this mm-hmm. type of trend, they would come up with specific, uh, you know, types of uh, signals. Right. And, and we would have things called 20T pulses, uh, 2T pulses, pulse and bars, multi-burst, multi-pulse, all of this kind of stuff. But audio is so outdated in that sense in that <laughs> we're still looking at harmonic distortion frequency response. Right. And which dates back to the 1920s, at least, or something like that. So, so I, what are the more modern techniques to do it? Uh, there's other ones that are looking into, like, the slew rates of amplifiers, and that's pretty important. So there's mm-hmm. uh, there's the CCIF uh, twin tone signal at, I think, like, 19 and 20 or 18 and 19 kilohertz. There's, uh, there's the TIM, transient intermod uh, mm-hmm. test which has a square wave and a sine wave. Uh, and then I have these other ones that I'm looking at to, to measure specifically uh, frequency modulation distortion. And there, there's just a lot more to, to look at. So so yeah. the, the whole idea of, okay, uh, I would say don't assume that uh, these things aren't real. Yeah, some of them could be suggestively um, psychological, right? Yeah, yeah, because of course. You, of course, if you buy, <laughs> you know, a ten thousand dollar wire, you might have to say it sounds better. <laughs> or at least tell your wife <laughs> you that know. it does, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. I, I totally yeah, got my money's worth. <laughs> but but there, but there but there are actually real um, there there are real breakthroughs uh, in uh, in in audio uh, in in the sense that, uh, for instance, in in phono preamps, uh, which is a subject that I had designed quite right. a bit of. Uh, it, you know, uh, basically you have to look at the reaction uh, to the input cartridge. Uh, and I think um, mm. Tom Tom Homan had written a paper on that. He's the guy who did the THX um, sound system back in right. the 70s. And basically he was looking at the nonlinear and capacitive uh, or the reactive inputs uh, of, of the uh, preamp. Because the cartridge is not a, you know, it's it's got a lot and of and each one's different, right? And each yes. one is different. So yeah. in theory, you would yeah. have to match. The best way to do it is to match a specific preamp circuit to a specific brand and model cartridge. Yeah, in theory. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. have like different load capacitances and different uh, load resistances, and you know, and not all of them are magnetic. Some of the uh, some of mm-hmm. them could be piezo type. Uh, some of them. Could be uh, they, they even had some that were I think condenser uh, you know yeah. uh, types oh, wow. and <laughs> and uh, and also uh, you know then there's moving coil cartridges as well and of course and so th- there are there are differences and but you know before so if you if you go back say uh, back in the 1970s or 60s well who would care about this because when we test our preamps <laughs> you know everything measures the same but but they're using a generator with you know 50 ohms or yeah. 600 ohm output driving this this preamp input they're not using a cartridge that has maybe anywhere from 200 millihenries to a thousand millihenries of inductance and then uh, you know and and how it reacts with all the different capacitances right yeah and all right and so so there, there was that, and then, then the other thing was the the, the the overload of some of these um, preamps were not really that good, and some people would say uh, a twelve volt supply is sufficient, and or a, mm-hmm. a particular kind of slew rate was sufficient, and and if you improve on any of those things, even raising the uh, the, the supply of the phono mm-hmm. preamp. And also raising the uh, the slew rate, you will hear a difference. And 
Uh, if well, it, there's a whole art yeah. in like overload recovery and stuff like that too. Yeah, and and you know there and there is some of the older preamps uh, did not even use uh, global or closed loop feedback. They were just like an independent stage followed by the by the uh, RIAA. Uh, you know, network, mm, and then yeah, followed network, by another yep. amplifier. That's the way some of the old tube ones worked out. Uh, and so that even has a different overload characteristic than if you had feedback, because when you overload a feedback system, uh, it takes it can take time to recover correctly. Yep. Mm, you know, that's right. at at the point when it's clipping, it's no longer under really any feedback. <laughs> the, the AC gain of the yeah. system has gone to zero basically you know and uh because because uh, it doesn't matter how much voltage you put at that point it's just this flat top you know uh, or or bottomed out somehow so yeah. um so there's there's a lot of there, there, so there is uh quite a bit of things in audio i would not dismiss them uh because mm-hmm. uh, people can hear the differences and the other thing is it does take people to are trained to listen to things uh, just the same way with in video uh, we yes. we or even looking at uh, uh, evaluating say uh, qualities of of film cameras or, or things like that uh, what to look for mm-hmm. and uh, I remember I think um, one of actually one of our scrambling systems went to a pretty large network in Australia <laughs> and and we right. and we actually satisfied their their needs but boy uh, they they had one guy there who was known as like the guys with the you know with with the sharpest eyes looking at the, the video artifacts and things like that I used to know a guy who had calibrated eyesight for he used to get it recalibrated every six months and he would have a certificate that said he <laughs> really? was the guy wow. calibrated at the video studio to look for color imbalance and distortion and all sorts yeah. of stuff yeah 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 you yeah. have to be specifically trained and have have proven eyesight. To <laughs> do you have do like it. a con- a contract where you have to wear sunglasses outside and everything like that? Too? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. So you don't damage your eyes. Yeah. 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 So it's it, it's uh, you know for instance in in the old days, um, people would look at a VHS uh, playback which has but roughly about a third to half the bandwidth uh, resolution as as a live video feed, mm. and. People will look at these things and say, "Boy, that looks like a clean picture, doesn't it? Doesn't that look sharp? <laughs> yeah, doesn't and that?" Relativity <laughs> in action, <laughs> you know. Or, or I think if you go back to like the 1940s, you know, people who heard, you know, a response that got up to 10 kilohertz at the time would say, yeah. "Wow, doesn't that sound so much like a it's, real?" It's like they're in the room thing. with me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? So, so it's all, it's all kind of relative. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say there's yeah. kind of a mixture, Dave, that the, that there are some hi-fi stuff that may actually be, let's say, called the hyperbolic in the way how it is described. <laughs> some? The, well, um, there's actually a lot. And, <laughs> and then, but, then, but then, you know, there are things that, that are kind oh, of, of real. Yeah, yeah. And, but not everything, we haven't figured out all the measurements on how to relate that yet. And, yeah. mm. and I was even talking to one person, I said, we don't even have a study where we say if you have, say, a half a percent of second-order harmonic distortion in your uh, in your mm. audio system, how does that really sound? And actually, have maybe a hundred people to agree on that that actually right, that yeah, it actually yeah. sounds that way, you know? And so you haven't even done basic studies like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and and most amplifiers will distort differently in that it has you know seconds thirds fourth fifth you know all mm-hmm. sorts of harmonics and intermodulation and so it, we can't even agree on exactly <laughs> you know how the distortion even sounds like or, yeah. And, yeah. yeah yeah so <laughs> so, so then people throw just... up their hands up in there and they say well I'll just put it through a tube i don't care anymore yeah yeah <laughs> but it, it, actually my favorite Preamps were tubes. Uh, I, I really enjoy <laughs> playing around fuzzy with my, right? <laughs> my 12x7s and or yeah. my ECC 83s and stuff like that. And, yeah. and uh, uh, they they just have a very nice sound to it. And I was explaining to one person the other day that you know open loop a a triode has almost a hundred times lower distortion than a transistor. Interesting. You know? Right. Yeah. There you go. So. <laughs> so. Well, Okay. Let's 
let's talk about your book, shall we? Yes. Is this your only book? This is build my your only own, book. This is... Build your own transistor radios. Yeah. It's called, folks. We will link it in, and um, it's highly acclaimed, apparently. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, asked a few professors uh, to look at it, and actually two of them, and both of them thought they looked pretty good, and actually... I think like a third one actually went out and bought the book and thought it was pretty good too. And the hardest part of writing the book was the last half of the book, which contains a lot of equations, formulas that were based on some graduate, well, one graduate class and another class on on uh, large signal behavior of transistors and to make sure mm -hmm. all that was correct. And yeah. uh, because the worst thing you want to do is to have a book uh, that you know that may be a little bit inaccurate so i think it's as accurate as it's going to get <laughs> well, I do, is I, this a new book is this fairly how, how long has it been out uh this has been out for just a couple of months uh the right. project started in late 2011 i think around december and i had to get the first manuscript done by the end of uh, may of 2012 so that was only like you know eight months ago or something like that and mm -hmm. uh, and then we went for the next four months uh trying to uh make it look uh, you know trans uh, basically make the tra the transition from a transcript a manuscript into a real real looking book to make it look you know something yep. that's better because there's only so much you can do on a word processor yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got it. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the um, things that I, so, I, I really like about this is, um, you know, you really do start out with a lot of context to start with, and I think, you know, that that's really important for because because it does seem like a, you know, it starts as a high, it's you know, even tagged as a hobbyist guide to the high performance and low powered radio circuits. But I think, um, you know, if you're coming into it as a hobbyist and then, you know, you flip to the back, you're like, oh, crap, equation, equation, equation. But before that, there's actually, yeah. you know, tons of context on how these are built, all the components, all of the, uh, you know, test and measurement type stuff up, up front. I, I really do. I really do yeah. appreciate that. You know, it's, it's really helpful. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, when I wrote this thing, I said, like we're in chapter four where uh, I explained, OK, we're going to build some signal generators and and the reason why is i didn't really want the reader to go outside and buy you know a b and k mm -hmm. or or some hp generator and spend you know a, a lot of money on where's it where's the fun in that yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i mean for for people in silicon valley it's fun we just go to the flea market and pick up one for five bucks and fix it up <laughs> right <laughs> but, but it isn't that way uh elsewhere and and this was also a good way to kind of like uh, show what the AM signal looks like, what it kind of resembles, and how you actually make this thing. And yeah. because that's the other thing people might ask: that, well, it's an AM signal, but how do you, how did they make it? You know, how, how is a way how to make an AM signal? So mm -hmm. I I, mm -hmm. I decided to show that. And uh, at actually at the end of chapter twelve uh, on on the uh, software defined radios i say this kind of like ends the first half of the book but stick around for the second half you know if, if you're an engineer <laughs> we're gonna blow your mind like that. yeah <laughs> here yeah. comes the and, math baby <laughs> yeah but you know i i restricted it uh entirely to high school mathematics although yeah. i do slip in some fourier and i do slip in some complex variables but I kind of say this is what it is, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and and I don't explain the the uh, the power series expansion based on Taylor series. I, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, if you look in other books when they give you the power expansion, they'll put it in terms of kT over Q and those kind of uh, constants. And I just gave real numbers and say yeah. this this is what it really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go, and, I, and so I really try to. Uh, avoid doing that because I, I, I think people who go through college and have to almost suffer through that kind of stuff have seen enough <laughs> of it. So here's an intuitive <laughs> way of of what's going on. Yeah. And good man. Yeah. Well, Dave, Dave kind of alluded to it before <laughs> with with you know I I didn't have much of a hobbyist background, but I was I was ranting about this the other day about 
about you know math classes and not having the context there and yeah and, and and how it's not there but if if you are looking you know if you're looking at all this stuff and you're actually figuring out you know okay i built this radio i see the signal on an oscilloscope i see that there's you know frequency responses and all this other stuff then when you finally do get to taylor series and power series and all that other stuff you go oh just mm-hmm. just like you yeah. did ron with with um with with the tank circuit you were talking about earlier in the show you know yeah. like you have that context that's what's important yeah it's and so the book basically walks over some basic concepts in the first 12 chapters. It talks a little bit about output resistance, which uh, if you take your first IC class or actually maybe second second electronics class like, like at a university, they'll talk about this thing about early voltages and, you know, the, the change in uh, uh, change in collector to emitter voltage over mm-hmm. the change in collector current that will give you R0 or something like that. But, you know, in that context, it doesn't really mean a lot. But I show why it's, it's meaningful because uh, in the, if you stick it directly into a tank circuit, for instance, you can lower the Q of the tank circuit. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. and, and why it's not effective as much when you load it into a tapped uh, tank circuit. And and then I also talk about uh, uh, transconductance, but not in the usual manner of what people learn in school. And we have to develop a hybrid pi model or you yeah. know, small okay. signal hey. analysis. Hey. And, <laughs> right. so, and now this, we're going to learn <laughs> you know, all about the node and mesh equations and stuff like uh, that. I, you yeah. know, that's rather not very interesting to look at uh, because – I want to show it in the context of what transconductance really mean and and what are mm-hmm. the consequences of it in a transistor. So so when you increase uh, the collector current, the the transconductance go up proportionally. Yeah. Things like that, and and then why that is important because that's actually causing distortion in a sense as well. Because right. and so I try to I try to weave everything together as much as I can in this, and it was pretty remarkable in the sense that uh i had only 26 weeks to do this yeah and huh. and i was able to do it uh, at least i think reasonably okay <laughs> which is not a lot of time to write a book let alone a technical book right um yeah because the the, the rough rule of thumb is any good book takes you like a year to write yes yet yet alone let alone a technical one yes um you know you can double that so did you work full time on it, or I, I did. How, how I did work right. full time okay. at it, and uh, and as I explained to someone in the process of this writing this book, I also used up uh, one pound of solder, oh, wow. building up all the <laughs> prototypes. <laughs> that's so, great. So that uh, that tells you how many how much breadboarding I did. Yeah. Because wow. uh, Because the, yeah. the, the breadboard that you see in the front, that's the one that was shown on EDN magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that's actually not really recommended to build. But so I built all the other breadboards. You know, every circuit, or virtually yeah. every circuit that's project here, it was built because I had to make sure it worked and 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 test it. And and uh, I have roughly about twenty, roughly about twenty six breadboards. It, it came out oh, wow. like almost one breadboard per chapter. Yeah. And so that that's why I ended up using up a whole pound of solder. Wow. <laughs> that is a ton of work. Yeah. I mean, really, can you it tell really it, like how much time was spent actually building and testing stuff compared to actually writing? It's so Do you think? Yeah, so this is how it kind of went for like two two or three months uh before I got into the second half of the book, which is basically a lot of theory. Uh, it was like on Monday, either Monday or Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, I would come up with the design of what I want to do. So like, uh, suppose I mm. want to do a reflex radio. Okay, I'm going to design all these things from scratch. I'm not going to take things from the web. <laughs> because, I was, right. because if I design wow. it myself, I know what I'm doing. Right. Then you right. we get to blame uh, you, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I would design the thing. I would build it up maybe on day two test it everything by day two or three wow. by thursday it will be an orcad day thursdays were always orcad <laughs> days and i would take the schematics and 
and figure out all the figures I'm going to be using. I'm going to be uh, for for that particular chapter. So I would actually map out not only the schematics but any block diagrams and stuff like that, or mm -hmm. any computer generated waveform that's from the graphing calculator, and and then finish that. Then it would be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I would do all of the writing. <laughs> and then that's one and chapter. And in the meantime, you had no life. <laughs> right. And then, and then, and then on Monday it started all over again with the next chapter, which was oh, maybe no. Super Hat, and and it went on like that. And and so I thought. So you set yourself a goal of one chapter a week. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't wow. have much of a choice because it was Jeez. mainly my. Uh, I was a little bit too slow in getting the idea to them quick enough and they they have a hard deadline uh at the end of may mm. so i had to right i had to get this done and i said okay i i can get it done i've done some crazy things before but i think i can do this you know and uh, um you know awesome. for instance the the scrambling system i did for uh for south america that i i designed this board that was like um, 80 square inches, had surface mount components all over it, 1,100 parts, did that all within something like four weeks or something like that, you know, and, wow. and got it working. So, and it worked? So, so I Damn. Said, yeah, it worked. It <laughs> actually worked. That's awesome. And, uh, wow. um, and so I said, okay, I, I think I can do this. If this is worse because i got to do this for six months. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so, so I said, I hope i got enough stamina to do this yeah, thing. Yeah, man. And, 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 so, and, and there were days where I woke up and I said, what do I – tell the, the reader today <laughs> what do I offer different because if uh, you know those who have read the book will notice that it's really not like a like a typical book on how it explains things and and I give it my own interpretation and and my intuitive uh, you know thoughts on it and so I try to make everything original, and that's that's pretty hard to do every week, you know, on on a different subject. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, but my 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 hats off to you. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Thanks. It's. Uh, I look at it today, and I say, I, I there's no way I can do this. Again. <laughs> I was going to ask if, if if they said you have another twenty six weeks, like would you would you go for it? <laughs> yeah. You know, I you know, if I had to do another one, it it may be simpler than this. Like, I'll do one <laughs> not for advanced beginners, but for beginners, and then I could spend more time on construction techniques and stuff like that. You know, mm, and, yeah, right, and, yep. and yeah. Uh, the, uh, but on the on the theory, uh, if you know, if I should have a chance to add more to the book, I I will. There are some topics I want to add some more to. Uh, like FM radios and things like that, yeah. And because uh, mm -hmm. this one covered only AM radios, but but FM is is a whole subject on its own, and yeah. and right. not too many not too many universities even cover that too much anymore. So, but FM mm -hmm. is pretty near and dear to me because uh, you know uh, from the experience from uh, video tape recorders and yeah, that's right, and yeah. also from you know the AES papers. So <laughs> so I, I I can definitely add some more to it but we'll see how it works out i'm just happy to uh, tell reveal some of the secrets i've known for you know the last 30 years and awesome you it's know like... it's it's and and i hope it, it people do find it unique you know at least some parts of it <laughs> yeah so how did you get involved in writing the book did tab approach you or did you have an idea and you approach them how does it work oh the so if if you read the um the acknowledgements uh the biggest uh, catalyst to this whole thing was paul rako oh okay. and he he had shown some radios on his edn blog and I mentioned to him, I think during one of the flea markets, hey, you know, I've built some radios before. Could I shoot you some photos? One was a regenerative tube radio, and the other one is the one you see in the front cover of the book. Right. And so he said, sure. And so he looked at it. He was intrigued. And so he posted it, and he told me 
that he had never seen so much web traffic on two, you know, on anything, let alone just two radios. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of interest in it. Apparently, hit some type of uh, interest there, you know, some nerve there. Mm-hmm. So, so, <laughs> so, and then he told me, like, I know this guy at McGraw Hill. Why don't you give him, you know, uh, a call? And so I. I email him, and then he kind of says, well, what do you want to write about? I said, let's try transistor radios because, or radios of some sort because there's so much web traffic on this thing, and let's try it out. Yeah. And so that's that's how it started. Wow, and they and they took a, a chance on that because really yeah. as, a, as a technical publisher, I would, you know, I would have assumed that they would have gone transistor radios. Are yeah. you kidding? You yeah. want to release a book with yeah. on the Thir- title Transistor Radio? Ago, maybe, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, try yeah. fifty. Yeah. But you know? there's a, there is a yeah. lot of interest still. Well, the, the interest was I told them I said the first half of the book was going to be okay. So this is how I worked it out. I worked out the outline, and he said you need to do X number of pages. And I looked at it and I said, well. Do I stop at chapter 12 with these radios or do I go on with a chapter 13 to 15 with even more radios? I say, geez, I mean, is the reader going to be so tired of, you know, like how many combinations of radios does this guy right. going to be, <laughs> be building? And, and I said, you know what? I should do a second half of the book where it explains in better detail how these circuits work, how the signals work. And things like mm-hmm. that, and and that became uh, basically chapters thirteen to twenty-two, and then uh, right, and then uh, and as I was outlining it, I said, you know, by the time they go through these next ten or eleven chapters or whatever, they're going to be tired of all the equations. <laughs> so the last chapter is called "Learning by Doing," which means that you get to play with the circuits again, and you don't really have to look at uh, equations mm. much at all just kind of kind of feel out the circuit you know like w- what a lot of analog engineers do uh, yep. to, to yep. use their intuition and and things <laughs> like that and uh, and uh, I found a perfect vehicle for it uh, using spectran uh, which allows you to turn your computer into an audio spectrum analyzer and from there you can you can witness you know the distortion products, the mixing products, the um, uh, all sorts of little things. You know, or the Fourier series yep. of of a twenty five percent duty psycho waveform. So mm. uh, I thought that was perfect for that. And then plus some other things like uh, uh, I kind of dated myself by saying, well, when I was in college, I built my breadboards on these eighty column cards that were used <laughs> on IBM key punching machines and things like. But you can Oops. do it with an index card today, you know. <laughs> so all of those, all of those eighty column cards you see back in the nineteen sixties, where it goes through these sorters, and you know you see all the hose, right. the hollerith uh, hose or whatever on them, and and uh, mm-hmm. so that's what I used to used to. To do, and of course, that kind of tells you kind of maybe my attitude toward the computers. <laughs> it only had a use for making a bread where I wasn't too interested in the computer programming. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so people can buy this book on Amazon. They can buy it on Build Am- your own transistor radios. Yes, uh, they can buy it. On Is the- it available on the Kindle? It is uh, electronically. Oh. I think both on Kindle and I think uh, the Sony Reader as well. Oh, okay. And, and it's uh, it's uh, priced very nicely, at least here. It is for a technical book. Yeah, yeah. right. This is and, this is textbook level at 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 uh, commercial uh, prices. Yeah. At, yeah, yeah. Paperback fiction prices. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you know, and it's not written exactly like a textbook, but it does get into complex um, subjects. You know, especially the thirteen and fourteen, uh, those two chapters, and. Yeah. Uh, and you know the, the most favorite chapter I had uh, was really fifteen. Fifteen was my definitely the most favorite chapter I, I had written. So, mm-hmm. and what's that one? That one has to do with the mixers and uh, a lot of stuff concerning IQ mm-hmm. um, signals and things like that. It's it's just that's the black magic uh, sub. That's the black magic. But it's it's mostly mixers. So- um, Right. Let's see, I follow up with IQ later on 
Uh, yeah, it's but, a sampling theory and sampling um, mixers. But the but I tried mm. to I tried to do it without the e to the j omega kind of stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Thank and, you, thank you. And, and the, <laughs> reason, well done. the mm. reason why is I once asked a guy, where do I buy one of these e to the j omega <laughs> signal sources? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the the other part, the i thing. sign omega t part. Where do you get that? You have to go to the Twilight Zone or someplace yeah. like that. You know, because never, it's never imaginary. <laughs> you know, and so I I try to do everything with with real functions. You know what you see on a scope. You know, because yeah. Right. Yeah, you yeah, know, that's right. I mean, if it's real, I, you can scratch and sniff it. Yeah, you know? I mean, you don't go and say, "Hey, I'm 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 going to use my Tektronix 465 or whatever or my TDS 210 and I'm going to look at a E to a J omega signal." <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, be my guest, you know. <laughs> I have no idea what you're going to be looking at. <laughs> Uh, of course, I'll probably give them the pun. Well, use your imagination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ka-ching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. so I, yeah, so 15 was definitely my favorite um, one. But there's there's a lot of fun ones there. Do yeah, you have any of the other pictures? Uh, the one thing that, that it, it is short on is, is more pictures of the assemblies because you have these great yeah. schematics and all the, the, uh, the bomb, the bomb list for everything. But, yeah. but then, you know, you talked about all these builds you did and there's only a couple in there, unfortunately. Yeah. You... It's, I think if you go on the McGraw Hill site, they actually when I posted all 26 of those, oh, uh, good. almost okay. all of them. And, what, uh, and, I, and I'll actually, I'll send you, I'll send you it. Okay. Yeah, uh, we'll get those because, in the show notes. Yes. Because it's pretty funny when you look at that. Then you kind of like know why I used a whole pound of solder. Yeah. Uh, of doing <laughs> yeah. all that and soldering all that and, copper and these, clad together. Yeah, yeah, and these were all done sort of like the Jim Williams way, except a lot dirtier and cheaper. Which is <laughs> the, saying something. Yeah. the the um, <laughs> basically the ICs were done, you know, upside down. With, yes. You know, dead bug. Yeah, dead bug. And, yep. Uh, because I just did not have time to put on a vector board. It takes it takes okay. like three times more duration to to uh, build something on yep. a vector board. And that's probably right. And, yeah. and when you need to change something, it's much easier on a copper clad than yeah. unwinding things. You know, in a vector board. <laughs> it's right. Just, it's well, just. And you get that nice hard. ground plane too. I mean, I, I like that. I mean, the yeah. you get that nice big infinite plane, right? Nice big low impedance. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, yeah, and it's and this is actually you know one to two megahertz stuff. Oh, the only thing that's in there that's higher frequency is the forty meter mm-hmm. uh, front end circuit for the for the uh, software defined radio and uh, that one. But even then, the leads don't have to be that short, you know, because mm-hmm. forty meters is a pretty long wavelength. So if you keep anything yeah. within two inches, that's going to be fine. Yeah, and. So that, that's uh, that's kind of like uh, the gist of it. But you know, the, the the last half of the book, yeah, I, it was actually harder than I thought it was going to be. But uh, it it turned out okay, I think, because so far, uh, at least a couple of professors think it's they're they're fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, I I really hope you know so. A former guest, uh, Ken Lungberg, started a prototyping class, and I would love yeah. to see something like this book be turned into a class as well, because because like what I was saying about the context up front, and then you learn the the theory on yeah. the back end. I mean, that kind of stuff is just it's killer. That's the way to that's the way to teach. Mm-hmm. So that's why I really like this book. Yeah. I think it's Thank the way you. to go. Yeah, actually, I, I've met Ken. Oh yeah, uh, he comes he comes out at flea market every now and then, and and uh, you know so. We we talk about a few things and you know it's it's uh it's it's good if he's going to do that. Uh, I mean, the, I can, one of the things I had hoped to envision was maybe this could be used as a, a reference book for lab classes in universities. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, just yeah. just to show what real things. <laughs> well, you, know, you have to turn the like. price up to about two hundred bucks, I think, at, at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, you know, I just you know I. You know, I have uh, people who are college age, and they tell me that they have to pay like a hundred and fifty dollars for a calculus book. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, it's I, nothing. I just frown on that. I say, geez, this is this is so expensive, and mm-hmm. you know, and the book that I want to give to these people, are, you know, I mean, it's it's there's basically, I think, as one person told me, it's basically like two books in one, maybe even three. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 
I, I look at it as this way. It's a book of ho- for hobbyists, a book sort of, of theory, but it's also maybe in a third way a book of, of how I view I would teach somebody this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so so when I'm ex- when you're reading this thing about how I'm explaining how this thing worked and what's the background, what's the motivation, that's basically how I explain things to people. And well, now now we need an audio book form. Then we need to, we need to have you in our earpiece <laughs> reading it to us. <laughs> video as well. There you go. Video would be good too. Well, I'm not, <laughs> no, you, you should, can build you the radios again. <laughs> you, you should get to get a probably a good radio actor to read this thing with uh, with more emphasis well that's not us no definitely not us <laughs> um, uh, my squeaky australian voice my nasally yeah, I'm, Ohio I'm a little accent. bit too monotonic for most people so <laughs> uh, well i think our time is up okay yeah. great right? Yeah, we've been going for an hour and a half. Yeah, okay. it's awesome. By. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, thank you very it's much. Been Dave. fantastic. And thank yeah, you, Chris. Great, yeah, it was really great having you on here, Ron. We really appreciate it, and and I I highly recommend that everybody go out and, and grab a copy of this book, Amazon or Absolutely. wherever else you can get your hands on it. Um, it's it's awesome. So, very nice work. Thank you for sharing the uh, history of all the audio and video stuff i find that fascinating me too yes yes that was uh well i i, I think in general uh, video is kind of uh, uh taking a back seat on, on a lot of the other analog um i guess uh, topics you know most of it's mm. usually like op amps and things like that and mm-hmm. uh people but you know those are those are very important too. all all of the linear non-linear ic uh developments that that have been done over the years that's played a huge role in our industry yeah definitely absolutely all right thank you very much ron okay thank you catch you later